So this is our Nazma Ponti reading group. We are continuing our reading of the structure of behavior, picking up from page 137 of the translation. So we're in chapter three, uh, physical, vital, and human orders. Um, so we, like in the last session, we just started that chapter. Um, uh, so we read the introductory section of the chapter. And um, so like he, what he's sort of presented here is um, more, I guess, the problem that he wants to uh, you know, investigate in the rest of this chapter, which has to do with the relationship between these three, uh, you know, orders of reality or these three kinds of structures, the, the physical, the vital, and um, the, what is it, the, the human order, or sometimes you could say the mental order or symbolic order. I think these are all sort of synonymous terms. Um, but uh, so the idea is that, um, as we saw in the last chapter, there's a kind of um, uh, specificity to um, the environment of a living being in the sense that you can't just sort of take the physical description of that environment and of the you know, impact of, uh, you know, forces and chemicals and so on on the organism, um, you know, and then sort of use that, like take that as like a description of that organism's environment and, and then... Uh, study that organism's behavior in that in those terms. Um, so what you have to do instead is see, you know, what that, um, you know, what the, what aspects of the environment are important for the, um, for the organism, and then what those aspects mean for that organism. So like, for, um, uh, I'm trying to give an example. Um, I mean, organisms, you know, are sensitive to things that are uh, potential food sources for them or potential predators or uh, potential mates, uh, et cetera. But everything else about the environment is more or less meaningless to them. They just ignore it. It has no, like, impact on their behavior. Um, so, like, if you want to understand an organism's behavior, you have to consider what, uh, you have to sort of put yourself in the shoes of that organism and say, what, what is the environment um, you know, how, how is the environment uh, presented to that organism? Uh, and so there's a, a distinction here between like the physical description of the world in terms of these objective measurable quantities like you know, temperature and mass and so on. Um, and then the uh, sort of inner description of the world from the perspective of that organism uh, in which you, ha you don't have objective quantities, you have all these um, uh, sort of qualitative um, features of the world, uh, and in particular, they're all context dependent in the sense that, um, for example, uh, color is uh, dependent on um, all the color constancy effects that we looked at uh, in the previous chapter. Uh, you know, what color a surface seems to have depends not just on the wavelength of light reflected off the surface to, to your retina, but also what the uh, ambient illumination is. Um, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's this sort of uh, holistic or contextual um, character of the um, reception of uh, elements of the environment that is characteristic of this vital level. Um, and so this means that there's a sort of distinction in structure between the physical description of the world and this uh, description of the world from the perspective of an organism. Um, and then like the third level, which is one that he, he focuses on less, but which he, he did talk about in the in the previous chapter, is this symbolic sort of description of the world. So you can think of like um, representing the world on a map or drawing, um, uh, you know, a architectural plan of a building and so on. You have like this representation of the world in, in terms of some uh, symbolic system. Um, uh, and and um, this is also distinct from the previous two kinds of uh, sort of uh, structure of the world. Uh, and then, the, so the question, of course, is like how, yeah, how, how do you understand the relationship between these different orders of the world or structures? Um, and he, so the first, in the introduction here, he talks primarily about um, the kind of answer to this question that uh, has been given by Gestalt theorists. Um, uh, he's primarily uh, working with reference to Kafka. Um, and so one of the ideas that was introduced uh, by Kafka was this kind of uh, isomorphism between the physical and the vital levels or, the, or orders. Um, so the idea is that uh, you can, so there's no um, 
you can't identify the vital and the physical order, so you have to describe the phys the vital order sort of uh, in its own terms. You have to you know look at what elements of the environment are meaningful for the organism and in what way. Um, but at the same time, the kinds of principles that structure each of these orders are the same. And and so like one of the examples that he will appeal to is um, the way that uh, a soap bubble um, takes on a spherical shape uh, just through the uh, minimization of surface tension. So there's this sort of physical principle um, that brings about the, the formation of this simple shape, the, the sphere, um, this sort of regular shape just through the interaction of all the different molecules uh, uh, you know, that make up the bubble. Um, and then likewise in perception or in, uh, in general, in the sort of structure of the world from the perspective of the organism, there would be these sort of simple principles that um, bring about the perception of these figures, the gestalten, um, these uh, sort of good forms uh, is, is sort of the, the other term that is used for them. Um, and so you would, you would be able to sort of um, find these principles of explanation of the structure of uh, the vital order that would mirror the principles of explanation of, uh, that are used in the physical order. Uh, and then sort of ultimately, there would be a, a, a sort of roundabout reduction of the vital to the physical in the sense that um, all these sort of uh, principles that we identify at the vital order are uh, in principle supposed to be sort of uh, complicated expressions or like um, abbreviations for much more complicated expressions in the physical order. So we're all the principles that we identify in perception, for example, are ultimately um, like abbreviations for very complicated uh, processes going on in the nervous system of something like minimization of energy or some sim similar uh, process. Um, so again, we're, we're still ultimately taking the physical order to be um, what is primary and, and fundamental. And then the vital order is um, through this sort of less um, straightforward reduction still uh, reduced to the physical order. And uh, so this is not the route that uh, Merle Ponty is going to uh, follow. And he's going to, I mean, he's, he's only just sort of um, announced this at, uh, in the part that we've read so far. Uh, it's something that he's going to present uh, further as we go along. But the idea is that we should use the notion of form um, that the Gestalt psychologists introduce um, to describe uh, um, phenomena within the vital order. We should use that same notion to understand the relationship between these different orders. Um, so, um, yeah, th there's this notion of this intrinsic form, uh, something that is not reducible to the um, elements that make up the form. Uh, this same notion should be applied to the relationship between the phys physical and the vital and the symbolic orders. Um, so, like, yeah, as we've seen so far, or from what we've seen so far, this is just a sort of program or a, a promise. We haven't seen what exactly the make of this um, idea, but uh, that's sort of the, the problem that he's um, setting himself in this chapter. Uh, okay, so let's uh, jump into today's reading. Uh, if someone can read from 137 at the section heading. Yeah, I can read. Structure in physics. The notion of form, which was imposed upon us by the facts, was defined like that of a physical system. That is, an, as an ensemble of forces in a state of equilibrium or of constant change, such that no law is formulable for each part taken separately, and such that each vector is determined in size and direction by all the others. Thus, each local change in a form will be translated by a redistribution of forces, which assures the constancy of their relation. It is this internal circulation which is the system as a physical reality. And it is no more composed of parts which can be distinguished in it than a melody, always transposable, is made of the particular notes which are its momentary expression. Possessing internal unity inscribed in a segment of space and resisting deformation from external influences by its circular causality, the physical form is an individual. It can happen that, submitted to external forces which increase and decrease in a continuous manner, the system beyond a certain threshold redistributes its own forces in a qualitatively different order, which is nevertheless only another expression of its imminent law. Thus, with form, a principle of discontinuity is introduced, and the conditions for a development by leaps or crises, for an event or for a history, are given. 
let us say, in other words, that each form constitutes a field of forces characterized by a law, which has no meaning outside the limits of the dynamic structure considered, in which, on the other hand, assigns its properties to each internal point so that they will never be absolute properties properties of this point. Taken in this sense, the notion of form seems scarcely assimilable for classical physics. It denies individuality in the sense that classical physics affirms it, affirmed it, that of elements or invested with absolute properties. And on the other hand, it affirms it in the sense that classical physics denied it, since grouped particles always remain indiscern- remained discernible in principle. Well, form is a quote molar individ quote unquote molar individual. Nevertheless, Kohler has found examples of form in classical physics without difficulty. The distribution of electrical charges in a conductor, the difference of potential, and the electrical current. If one considers the state of equilibrated equilibrated distribution and maxim max entropy toward which the energies at work in a system t- according to the second principle of thermodynamics as a form, one can presume that the notion of form will be present in physics everywhere, that a historical direction is assigned to natural events. Um, When he says at the beginning of this first paragraph, the notion of form which was imposed by the facts, and that it uh, refers to this notion of form and that it's like a physical system, is he talking about uh, the notion of form that he wants to use uh, in order to sort of explain the unity of uh, these different orders, the physical, vital, and mental. It kind of seems like he is because he compares it to a melody, and so it sounds like a gestalt form, uh, which uh, is, I think, kind of what a form of behavior is. Yeah, I think he's, he's um, starting from the notion of form as it appears within the vital order. Um, so this notion of yeah, the, so there's like this melody is it's sort of running example. Um, it's not reducible to any um, sort of uh, you, you can't um, account for the structure of a melody, the form of a melody, by taking each individual tone to be a sort of self-subsistent whole, and then trying to connect each each tone to the next one. Um, that, that's sort of like the general um, uh, like takeaway from uh, the last chapter. Um, and then he's talking about this uh, sort of attempt uh, among the Gestalt psychologists um, to um, sort of identify the, this principle of form or this this structure of a melody with um, the, these kinds of physical structures. Uh, so this idea, uh, in particular, of like a field of forces, um, which has the a similar or in some sense similar um, characteristic that each, uh, like in the case of a magnetic field, for example, you have each point of the field has um, a vector assigned to it, indicating the the strength of the field and the direction it points, etc. Um, uh, but they are sort of independent, um, like atoms of magnetic charge, of, of magnetic um, intensity or something like that. They, like each element of the field is dependent on all the other elements of the field so you can't change one without changing all the others um and yeah so there, there's this uh attempt to identify the structure of a melody or the in more generally the the form as identified in the vital order with this sort of um um yeah holistic or interdependent structure of a field in physics or more generally of, of you know these these uh, particular um, quantities in the, in physics that have the same kind of uh, interdependency um, between between elements uh, where yeah so there's like the individual elements in the structure are not sort of atomic uh, self-contained entities that secondarily get um, connected to each other it, they're they're each each of the elements only is what it is um, in its relation to all the other elements in a particular structure. Um, but yeah, he's going, he's going to go on to criticize this um, this identification um, and and say it's not you know quite as accurate as uh, as some of these Gestalt psychologists are presenting it as. Uh, one thing that's interesting to me about this section, uh, going through these uh, you know the physical, vital, and mental orders. Um, obviously, this is also the structure of uh, Simon Don's individuation in light of notions of form and information. So it will be interesting to see the 
I I think that Merleau Ponty is going to have a different approach um, to the to unifying these different orders. Um, so it yeah, it'll be interesting to see the the differences in in uh, their approaches to that unification. Yeah, you can definitely see um, that they're both coming out of the same sort of uh, intellectual context, uh, you know, working on similar problems. Uh, um, but yes, they're they're going to um, give different sort of um, uh, ways of understanding the relationship between these different orders. Um, um, yeah, I think yeah we can maybe uh, like bracket that for now because it, it, we we haven't really seen what um, Merleau Ponty's um, uh, explanation is going to be. But um, yeah, I think that's a good question for us to like keep in mind as we are going through this to try to. Um, yeah, compare and contrast the the two explanations or the two um, accounts of the relationship between these different orders. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the um, next bit. Um, so someone can read from uh, But in Reality on page 138. Okay, I can read, but in reality. Uh, yeah, it's very quiet though. Um, can you, uh... Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Thanks. I think the mic has fallen. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but in reality, what Kuller shows with a few with a few examples ought to be extended to all physical laws. They express a structure and have meaning only within this structure. The electrical density in each point of an ellipsoid conductor can be successfully determined by a single relation which is proper to them all and to them alone, because together they constitute a functional individual. In the same manner, the law of falling bodies is true and will remain so only if the speed of rotation of the Earth does not increase with time. On the contrary hypothesis, the centrifugal force could compensate for and then go beyond that of gravity. Thus, the law of falling bodies expresses the constitution of a field of relatively stable forces in the neighborhood of the Earth, in the neighborhood of the Earth, and will remain valid only as long as the cosmological structure on which it is founded endures. Given these experiments gives us an independent Ansoa law only if it is supported by the Newtonian conception of gravitation. But if the notion of gravitational field is introduced, and if instead of being an individual and absolute property of heavy bodies, gravitation is tied to certain regions of qualitatively distinct space, as the theory of generalized relativity holds, the law could not express an absolute property of the world. It represents a certain state of equilibrium of the forces which determine the history of the solar system. Upon reflection, one finds in these laws not the principal traits as if it were of an anatomical constitution of the world, the archetypes according to which the physical world would be made, sorry, would be made and which would govern it, but only the properties of certain relatively stable holes. That was whole instead of like whole. In our image of the physical world, we are obliged, 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 sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the word. Um, we are obliged, I think, to introduce partial totalities without which there would be no loss and, we, and which partial totalities are precisely what we understood above by form. The combined interplay of laws could withdraw existence from structures which had become stable and bring about the appearance of other structures the properties of which are not predictable. Thus, there is a flow of things which supports the law, the laws and which cannot be definitely resolved into them. To treat the physical world as if it were an intersecting of linear causal series in which it keeps, in, it's in the, uh, in which it keeps its individuality, as if it were a world in which there is no duration, is an illegitimate extrapolation. Science must be linked to a history of the universe in which the development is discontinuous. We cannot even pretend to possess genuine quote unquote causal series, models of linear causality in our established science. The notion of causal series can be considered a constitutive principle of the physical universe only if the law is separated from the process of verification which gives it which gives it objective value. The physical experiment is never the revelation of an isolated causal series. One verifies that the observed effect indeed obeys the presumed law by taking into account a series of conditions, such as temperature, atmospheric pressure, altitude. In brief, 
that is, a certain number of laws which are independent of those which constitute the proper object of the experiment. Do I keep going? Um, uh, yeah, maybe we can stop here, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so here, yeah, so he's, I guess, um, sort of, so he, he started before, like in the, the first bit we read, he started with this opposition between the, the level of, uh, you know, the vital order with its um, notion of form, and then the physical order as, as like distinct um, distinct orders or distinct um, sort of realms of the world. Um, but here he's going to sort of um, blur that distinction or, or show in, in certain ways why it, it is uh, not quite as straightforward as it seems. Um, so this idea that there would be like, so the, uh, what some of the Gestalt psychologists had tried to do was to identify specific physical structures or um, relations that have this uh, form um, nature to them. So things like an electromagnetic field where each of the points of the field is connected to all the others and, and they're all interdependent. Um, but what, uh, what he's doing here is to suggest that um, we can't really uh, like separate out one specific kind of physical structure that has this, this form quality um, and then others which would not, which would be characterized by this sort of atomistic structure where each element is self-contained and, and then only secondarily connected to the, the rest. Um, we instead have to, like our sort of ultimate picture of the universe, uh, even at the physical level, has to be one uh, in which uh, everything is a form. Um, so um, even something that is um, sort of a seemingly um, mechanistic or uh, uh, yeah, better term would be atomistic. So something like New Newton's law of gravitation, or you know the Newtonian uh, world picture in general, um, it's still like so it, it's based on uh, this idea of these um, independent point masses, which are uh, then subject to gravitational forces. Um, and Newton himself, um, um, you know, there's a, the famous line that uh, I do not stay in hypotheses. So this idea that he do, he doesn't try to explain how gravitation works. He just gives um, the uh, laws that um, uh, reproduce the observed motions of the planets and so on. Um, but uh, then, uh, like in some of his other writings, especially stuff that was not published during his lifetime, he does try to give mechanical accounts for uh, for gravitation. Uh, and he was also you know, very interested in alchemy, um, uh, and so this idea there is a kind of affinity between different elements of matter. But in general, there's this um, idea that you start with these self-contained point masses, and then you have to explain secondarily how they are connected to each other to bring about uh, gravitational attraction. Um, but you can sort of uh, switch things around, and uh, this, you know, Melvin Ponty is su suggesting that this is like a, a better picture, is that you're starting from a system, the solar system, or ultimately the universe as a whole, um, uh, that is structured by this gravitational force um, in such a way that each of the elements um, is connected to all the others in this in this um, pattern that we call gravitational attraction. Um, um, and um, yeah, so there's like uh, a certain real entity that is structured a certain way. Um, and then we can sort of uh, conceptually separate out individual parts of that structure and say this one is, is one planet and this is the sun, and and then describe the the law that governs their interaction. Um, but this is a sort of um, abstraction from the concrete reality, which is this uh, sort of dynamically interconnected system um, that is evolving through time. Um, and um, so this picture of the physical world is made up of these sort of point masses, uh, these self-contained uh, atoms that are um, uh, subject to this linear causal evolution. Uh, and then, you know, in, in maybe the more complicated cases, there's interaction between these different elements uh, when they collide with each other or uh, through gravitation or, or whatever. Um, uh, this picture is a kind of abstraction from the more fundamental, uh, more concrete picture of the world as this um, um, development of uh, a structured whole um, through history. Uh, so it's only insofar as this whole universe uh, system has a particular structure or particular form 
um, that governs its development through time in the same way that a melody has a form that is uh, uh, realized through time. Uh, it's only in that sense that we can, um, it's only because of that or on the basis of this melody, melodic structure of the universe that we can like abstract these um, uh, point masses and uh, you know, laws of gravitation and motion and so on uh, as, as a sort of secondary feature of the physical world. And then this last bit about the experiment is actually something that's come up um, in like 20th cent later, like second half of the 20th century um, philosophy of science, uh, which is that, um, uh, so Nancy Cartwright in particular, she has a book called um, How the Laws of Physics Lie. And, and so like the, the basic idea is that like whenever you describe a law of physics, you know, uh, the law of gravitation or whatever, you know, these laws are always presented in terms of uh, um, what's called a ceteris paribus clause, uh, all things being equal. Um, so like you say, like, uh, like if you think about like Galileo establishes his law that all uh, bodies uh, of equal mass fall with equal velocity, um, um, this of course is not true if like you take a, a bag full of feathers and a, a lead weight that has the same mass as the bag full of feathers. Um, if you drop them off a, a tower or whatever, the lead weight will fall to the earth. Uh, the bag full of feathers will sort of drift slowly down to the ground. Um, so this law, if you apply it literally, is actually false. Um, it's, so you add this all things being equal clause uh, with the uh, interpretation in this concrete case that they, they would fall equally in a vacuum and, and you explain the fact that the bag full of feathers um, uh, does not fall at the same speed um, by means of the uh, concept of air resistance. So you say like sort of more uh, in, the, in the pure case in, the, in a vacuum, they would fall equally uh, uh, with, the, with the same velocity, um, but you add the air resistance to explain why in the impure case when there is air or some other medium, they don't fall with the same velocity. Um, uh, but um, you can't, like, in principle, there's always, like, there's any number of other factors that could intervene. And it could be a magnetic field or whatever, like, any other um, kinds of interference. So when, when you use this kind of uh, all things being equal clause, you are um, excluding an infinite number of possible uh, count counteracting factors. You're saying, this law is true except when it's false, essentially. <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, so the uh, performance of a physical experiment uh, in general involves trying to ex exclude as many of these uh, counteracting factors as possible so that you can isolate one particular effect. So like uh, if you're doing a chemical experiment, for example, normally you would uh, do it inside uh, you know, a, a, a closed room. You don't sort of go out into a, a, an open field or like beside a road or whatever and try to perform your chemical experiment because you'll have like dust and uh, all kinds of other particles will get into your um, equipment and things won't work as you expect. Uh, so this is like a, a sort of very basic um, uh, like method that is used to isolate particular phenomena as, and, and exclude other phenomena that would make it hard to identify the one you're interested in. Uh, and then you, you do other things like you um, prepare sort of uh, pure uh, samples of your substance that you're trying to analyze. Uh, so you, you separate out the, the thing you're interested in from other um, things you're not interested in. Uh, you make sure the temperature is constant and the air pressure and so on. Like you, you do all these things to uh, exclude uh, all sorts of complications and, and, and other factors that would mask or counteract what you're interested in. Uh, in isolating, um, but you know, it, ultimately, that your your um, all you can do is just sort of say, like, here are the ten things that I know could uh, counteract the the effect that I'm interested in, or that could um, bring about something that looks like the effect I'm interested in, in even if it's not actually that effect. Um, so all the different sort of uh, uh, factors that make it more complicated or or harder to observe. Um, but just because you've isolated the ten, or you, you've blocked out the 10 or whatever number of uh, other factors that you know about doesn't mean there's not like 100 others that you don't know about. Um, um, so all you can do essentially is, is like try to exclude as many as possible um, and hope that there's no, there's no others that you have missed or that you don't know about. Um, uh, 
uh, so yeah, the, the the experiment is a kind of um, uh, realization of this uh, intellectual abstraction process. So like the the abstraction that we do in our thought, where we say that you know the pure law of motion uh, of falling bodies involves um, the equal acceleration, uh, you know, regardless of the shape and density and so on. Um, this is something that we can sort of approximate by doing our experiment of dropping the lead weight in the bag of feathers in a vacuum. So we're isolating the uh, law of fall of the bodies from this uh, counteracting factor, which is the air resistance. Um, uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to realize this uh, abstract intellectual law as much as possible by excluding all the factors that we know about that, um, that would complicate it or counteract it. But we can never, sort of in principle, we can never say, yes, this law is exactly realized in the world um, because there, there's always the potential that some other factor that we uh, haven't yet learned about or we don't know how to control uh, is, is also going to intervene in some way. Okay, uh, we can go on to the next section. Uh, 61, I don't know if you uh, have a mic or if you're uh, able to read today. Oh uh, yeah, one second, just sitting down. Yeah, sure. Where did we get up to in the reading? Uh, so we are on page 139, uh, the last uh, paragraph, properly speaking, therefore. Okay, perfect. Properly speaking, therefore, what one verifies is never a law, but a system of complementary laws. There could be no question of supposing point-for-point -point correspondence between the experiment and the physical laws. The truth of physics is not found in the laws taken one by one, but in their combinations. Since the law cannot be detached from concrete events, where it intersects with other laws, and receives a truth value along with them, one cannot speak of a linear causal action, which would distinguish an effect from its cause. For in nature it is impossible to circumscribe the author, the one responsible, as it were, of a given effect. Since we nevertheless succeed in formulating laws, clearly all the parts of nature must not contribute equally in producing the observed effect. The only valid formulation of the principle of causality will be that which affirms, along with a solidarity of phenomena in the universe, a sort of lessening, proportional to the distance, of the inf influences exercised on a given phenomenon by prior and simultaneous phenomena. Thus, laws in the linear relation of consequence to conditions refer us back to events and interaction, to, quote, forms from which they should not be abstracted, um, one can wonder if, dot, 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 in the different branches of pure physics, in the theory of weight and thermodynamics, in optics as in electromagnetics, a certain number of experimentally obtained coefficients are not introduced, which are tied to the structure of our world as such, and without which the laws, or rather the fundamental relations, can neither be completely formulated nor exactly verified. Without even leaving classical physics corrected by the theory of relativity, one can bring to light the adequacies in the positivist conception of causality, understood as an ideally isolable sequence, even if de facto it, inter it interferes with others. What is demanded by the actual content of science is certainly not the idea of a universe in which everything would literally depend on everything else, and in which no cleavage would be possible, but no more so is it the idea of a nature in which processes would be knowable in isolation, and which would produce them from its resources. What is demanded is neither fusion nor juxtaposition, rather it is structure. I suppose I'll go on. Um, but we must ask ourselves what exactly is proved by these reproachments. When one says that there are physical forms, the proposition is equivocal. It is incontestable if one wants to express the fact that science is absolutely incapable of defining the physical universe as a homogeneous field from which reciprocal action, quality, and history would be excluded. But in speaking of physical forms, Gestalt theory means that structures can be found in a nature taken in itself, or in soy, or, uh, and that mind can be constituted from them. However, the same reasons which discredit the positivist conception of laws also discredit the notion of forms in themselves. The one is not corrected by the other, and these two dogmatisms misunderstand the vital meaning of the notions of structure and law in scientific consciousness. Much more than opposed, they are complementary and represent antinomies which must be surpassed. Uh, no, we can stop here. Thanks. Um, yeah, so he, he's just sort of pointing towards the um, argument he's going to give in the, the next bit, but um, 
So yeah, so he's he's introduced this idea that um, when we talk about um, like laws of physics or this idea that there is a, a sort of isolated uh, element to this atom, uh, um, you know, not in the sense that it's used in like within physics itself, but an atom as like this uh, element uh, of a system that is self-contained and that has its properties uh, outside the system or intrinsic to it, and then secondarily gets connected to others. This is, this is sort of like the um, philosophical idea of an atom here. Um, this uh, this sort of atomic structure, this idea that the world the world is made up of these elements that have this isolated atomic uh, nature. Um, but yeah, this is a sort of abstraction from the the more concrete um, understanding of the universe as a, a system that has this form uh, property uh, that has this melodic development through time. Um, but uh, on the other hand, you can't sort of um, exaggerate this or, or push this idea too far because it's clear that um, uh, not every element of the universe is equally important to understanding every other. Um, so if you're studying, um, I don't know, a, a chemical reaction of some kind in your laboratory uh, on Earth, you don't have to worry about like um, the winds on Jupiter or whatever as like potential factors that might be um, interfering with your your chemical experiment, you can safely ignore what the you know weather on Jupiter is like um, when you're studying your uh, chemical in interaction on Earth. Um, so there's some sort of um, um, uh, he the way he describes it here is that sort of dropping off with distance. So um, whatever uh, structures or you know forces or whatever you want to use to describe them, the the, way, the connections between uh, elements of, of the whole system of the universe um, has some sort of uh, ordering in terms of um, how how important or how uh, how much influence one element has on another, and uh, and there's a sort of quick drop off in terms of um, how how strong that interaction is. So in principle, um, there is some sort of uh, gravitational um, uh, attraction between like the elements in the cloud uh, formations on Jupiter and your chemical experiment on Earth. Uh, um, but, you know, in, in practice, of course, there's no observable difference in terms of, like, whether the clouds on Jupiter are, you know, more dense on the side facing the Earth or, or on the side uh, opposite the Earth. Uh, it doesn't make any discernible impact on the, the way that your chemical experiment, uh, you know, proceeds and, and, and evolves over time. Um, so yeah, so we the the two sort of extreme positions would be either you can start from this universe made up of these uh, atoms that are completely self subsistent, and then um, sort of secondarily connect them with each other through like uh, the law of gravitation or something similar, uh, or uh, the universe is one giant like blob that uh, where everything is connected to everything else um, in an equally uh, strong or equally significant manner. Um, uh, and both of these alternatives are, are incorrect. We have to instead see the universe as being this sort of differentiated structure in which some elements are more important to others um, and others are essentially negligible. Uh, and it's only, it's only because of this differentiation that it's actually possible for us to even identify something like laws of nature in the first place. So we can, when we do an experiment, we, we can isolate our you know, chemical interaction from um, a lot of factors that are known to interfere with it, and we can, with uh, reasonable justification, assume that we are observing a simple interaction of you know something that is governed by like a simple chemical law or uh, a simple set of chemical laws. Um, whereas, if the universe was this kind of undifferentiated blob that where everything was connected to everything else, it would not be possible to to isolate um, one. Uh, you know, chemical reaction, um, you know, no matter how many precautions we, we took, it would still always be connected to everything else in the universe, and it would be impossible to isolate, like, a, a, a law of chemistry or a principle governing uh, this type of chemical reaction. I'm not sure I understand the difference between uh, structure and law, or sorry, structure and uh, form. I know earlier he talked about... Um, what was the word that he used? Establishing, I think, partial, yeah, partial totalities. So I don't know if the structure is supposed to be the system 
um, under study, and the laws are, are I guess, uh, the laws which are being isolated for study, which govern that system. And then I think at the end, is he's maybe going to to link form with perception somehow. But uh, yeah, as of now, this distinction between structure and form is kind of obscure. Yeah, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think he's using the word structure as a sort of neutral term here. Um, so a structure is, so a form in the proper sense, like this melodic um, sort of uh, interrelated uh, property uh, that he's identified in the last chapter as, as um, characteristic of the vital order. Uh, a form in this sense is a type of structure, but there uh, could potentially be other types of structures. Um, and and um, so a structure is just something in which there are identifiable elements uh, that are not all equally relevant to each other um, in, in sort of a very general sense. And then uh, a form would be uh, a specific type of structure in which um, there, there is, um, yeah, there, there is this uh, sort of interdependence of the elements, um, um, like in a melody where one note is uh, sort of uh, leads into the next one um, in, in, in some, uh, you know, melodic or harmonic sense. Um, so like, yeah, the term structure here is just essentially um, to be understood, I think, in, in distinction from these two notions of fusion or juxtaposition. So structure is not something that is uh, like an undifferentiated mass, like a, a universe as a giant blob in which everything is interacting with everything else in the same way. Uh, and uh, a structure is also not just uh, a mosaic of self-contained points. Um, um, it's something in which things are connected, um, but in a differentiated way. Uh, I think that's like sort of a, a general idea of, of this notion of structure. Um, and then, so from the notion of the universe as a structure, so this, this the idea that the universe is a structure is something we can um, uh, derive from the fact that it is possible to identify something like laws of nature, even, you know, very basic things like, you know, uh, bodies fall to the ground uh, is a, not a specific, not a very um, precise or scientific law. It's, it's something you can identify without, you know, doing systematic experiments, but um, even that structure is, um, uh, or, or even that uh, sort of general like principle of the behavior of, of bodies is something is something that can only be identifiable insofar as the world has this structure uh, nature to it and is not just a, a, a blob or a mosaic. Um, so yeah, we, we can identify um, sort of uh, any isolated or isolatable properties of uh, systems uh, within the world. Uh, so this shows that the world is a structure or the universe is a structure. Um, and then uh, what's characteristic of um, the sort of Galilean tradition in physics is to sort of uh, push that isolation to a conceptual abstract, uh, abstraction extreme. So the idea is that not only can we isolate um, systems uh, enough to identify their properties, but we can um, suppose the systems to be completely isolated um, uh, in principle, and then secondarily try to sort of reconstruct their connections to other systems through things like, you know, um, air resistance, uh, interactions of different forces and so on. Um, uh, yeah, so, so this would be like a, a sort of conceptual level in which you have elements and laws governing them um, as an abstraction from the concrete structure nature of the world in which there's this differentiated uh, sort of articulated property of the world in which not everything is uh, connected to everything else in the same way. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. I think I can, I think I kind of see um, how this is, you know, maybe the argument in this section is going to be something like structure is, is an abstraction from form and form is in the perceptual situation something along those lines, but I guess we'll see uh, by the end. Yeah, I think, I think the argument, um, I, I'm just going from memory here, but I think it's going to be a, a bit more complicated. I think he's going to suggest that each of the two sort of arises out of the other, that they're, they're sort of um, reciprocal concepts that um, we can't understand 
a law of nature without seeing it as abstracted from uh, this concrete structure property of the world. Um, uh, but then conversely, we can't um, we can't understand form without um, without seeing it as uh, some sort of like form uh, sort of treated intrinsically uh, is is just this sort of um, how do I want to put this? Uh, like to articulate a form, to express what a form is, we have to um, express it in terms of its elements. We have to say this element is connected to this other element in some other way. We have to sort of um, set the the components uh, or the elements of the form um, next to each other or outside each other. Um, so, like the grasp of a form, the conceptual grasp of a form has to isolate the elements in some sense. Um, um, we can't like. Yeah, sort of like this is a, maybe sort of a Hegelian point, but like this idea that, that you would be able to just grasp a form in some sort of like um, immediate intuition that you would just like, you know, have this structure given to you uh, and that would be sort of sufficient um, is something that you, you know, maybe you could have like a, 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 a quasi mystical experience of, of this, but like to be able to communicate it to someone else and grasp it conceptually, you have to actually articulate it in terms of concepts that involve. Um, some sort of differentiation and uh, connection of these elements. Um, so, yeah, we can only make uh, a form uh, comprehensible to to ourselves and to others insofar as we uh, express it in terms of um, differentiated elements. And then conversely, our grasp of something like uh, these differentiated elements and the laws governing them uh, is only comprehensible as an abstraction from the the form as this sort of concrete structure um uh yeah out of which the the abstraction is derived okay um yeah there's a lot going on in this bit um there's, there's like philosophy of science and you know this um sort of analysis of gestalt psychology and all this yeah everything all sort of intertwined with each other so yeah it, it's uh that's a sort of main what he's doing here is is in some sense like a, a mirror of the kind of structure that he's talking about because we have all these different um elements that are all interconnected with each other and to be able to grasp them conceptually we have to sort of separate them out um uh and and you know isolate them uh you know uh through some sort of conceptual abstraction um and then see how they you know fit back together um um yeah but ultimately it's this uh sort of internal solidarity of one with the other or this uh intrinsic relation of one to the other that is fundamental uh, and then our sort of conceptual separation and uh, differentiation is like a, a, a secondary operation of um, of uh, grasping these elements in isolation. Okay, uh, I can read the next bit. If against all right, the physical law is made a norm of nature, since the exercise of this law is possible only within a certain cosmological structure, this structure in turn will have to be posited as inherent in quote-unquote nature, as Lachelier has has shown clearly. The positivist universe of independent causal series ought therefore to be subtended by a universe of finality in which the synchronisms and ensembles which are presupposed by the causal laws provide the existential foundation of the latter, along with the raison d'être. But what makes the idea of a pure physical analysis chimerical is the fact that the cosmological given, the discontinuity of history, is not like a more profound layer of being, uh, an infrastructure of the physical world, world upon which the law would rest. Law and structure are not distinguished in science as a real analysis and a real synthesis would distinguish them. The law of falling bodies is the expression of a property of the terrestrial field, with, uh, which in reality is supported and maintained at each instant by the ensemble of the relations of the universe. Thus, the law is possible only within a de facto structure, but this latter in turn, far from being a definite given, uh, uh, the opaqueness of which would in principle defy analysis, can be integrated into a continuous tissue of relations. The relation of structure and law in science is the relation of reciprocal inclusion. We are insisting above against positivism on the inclusion of law in a structure. Now it is appropriate to insist on the inclusion of structures in laws. It is not only from the outside and by linking structure to the ensemble of phenomena that laws penetrate structure. Science decomposes the reciprocal determinations internal to a physical system into separate actions and reactions, but is ready to consider them, quote, each time with a determined number of empirical coefficients in such a way that it can obtain the synthetic combination which is destined to represent the total appearance which things present, unquote. Euler himself remarks that the structural character of a process does not find its expression in mathematical physics. The equation which gives the electrical density at each point of the surface of an ellipsoid conductor just as, uh, just as well represents the cor corresponding but purely mathematical values which one had arbitrarily assigned to different parts of a paper ellipsoid, quote. 
Consequently, the mathematical expression in and by itself does not reveal that moments of a form are involved, and it should not do so since mathematical language, the general symbolism of any measurable object, must be able to express distributions just as well as structures." Unquote. The fact that each quote-unquote moment, in the first case, exists only as sustained by the remainder, which is characteristic of structure, does not appear in, in its law. Physical knowledge of a structure of this kind begins, therefore, at the moment when, in order to define them by a constant property, different points are considered, points which in principle have no reality in the form. The form itself, the internal and dynamic unity which gives to the whole the character of an indecomposable individual, is presupposed by the law only as a condition of existence. The objects which, which science constructs, those which figure in developed physical knowledge, are always clusters of relations. And it is not because structure, by its essence, resists expression that physics only barely succeeds in formulating the laws of certain structures in mathematical language. It's because the existential solidarity of its moments renders the experimental approach difficult, prevents acting separately on, on one of them, and demands that a function which is appropriate to all of them be found initially. I cannot even say that structure is the ratio ascendi of the law, which would be its ratio cognoscendi. Since the, ascent, the existence of such a structure in the world is only the intersection of a multitude of relations, which, it is true, refer to other structural conditions. Structure and law are therefore two dialectical moments and not two powers of being. What is demanded by physics is in no case the affirmation of a fusis, either as the assemblage of isolable causal actions or as the place of structures, or the power of creating individuals in themselves, en soi. Form is not an element of the world, but a limit toward which physical knowledge tends and which it, it itself defines. In this sense, at least, it must be conserved, and a theory of physical knowledge, or with even more reason, a theory of historical knowledge, which would not make room for form, and which would define consciousness by the consciousness of laws, would not account for history and reality as objects of thought. After having rejected the dogmatism of laws, one cannot act as if they were sufficient to provide the temporal field or spatial field with its meaning, as if the quote-unquote non-relational ground on which the relations established by physics are based did not enter into the definition of knowledge. The effects of laws develop in time, and the appearance of a quote-unquote, synchronism at the intersection of several laws of an event which suddenly modifies the course of things and the distinction of a quote-unquote before and a quote-unquote after with respect to it, allows us to speak of a pulsation of universal duration. Doubtless, it is by means of laws that we are able to reconstruct the architecture of, civil of a civilization which has disappeared. Each step of progress in Egyptology modifies the history of Egypt. But the reconstituted structures function to complete a quote-unquote time of the universe, the idea of which they presuppose. They're not themselves real forces which would direct the course of history or add a quote-unquote causality of the idea, of idea to the causality which links together the part of the uh, events. But Egypt, as an economic, political, and social structure, remains an object of thought distinct from the multiple facts which have constituted it and brought it into existence. It is an idea, a signification common to an ensemble of molecular facts, which is expressed by all the facts and which is not contained completely in any one of them. In the same manner, the actions and reactions of, of, of which a physical form is the seed are conceived by the physicist as the components of a physical system, lacking which his science would be without object. Yes, yeah, so this bit is, uh, again, fairly dense. Uh, and then we have this sort of sudden introduction of Egyptology for sort of, you know, not very obvious reasons. Um, um, but yeah, so I think this is sort of what I was trying to express uh, a minute ago, just before we started this reading. Um, this, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a Simon Do style um, digression into Egyptology here. Um, Although at least it's it's not like a single sentence that takes up like twenty five lines, um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so this this idea that um, structure and law are sort of reciprocal concepts um, that each one is only understandable in relation to the other. So uh, the universe is uh, something that has this structure um, quality or this structure uh, nature to it. Uh, it's something in which there is this um, uh, interconnection or interdependence of the elements, but not um, this sort of uh, homogeneous interconnection. Uh, so it's this differentiated interconnection of elements. Uh, and it's only because of this um, differentiated interconnection of the elements of the universe that there is something like a law that we can isolate. So um, it allows us to um, study the properties of one uh, you know, piece of matter or one organism or one, uh, uh, I don't know, physical um, force or whatever um, in relative isolation from the rest of the world um, and to identify, you know, what principles govern the uh, behavior of this uh, element of the world. Um, so yeah, th this is the dependence of law on structure. Um, 
And then the other direction is um, that, um, yeah, he, he doesn't really go into this in, I think, as much uh, detail as the, the first direction. Um, yeah, I think the, the idea is that, um, yeah, we can only understand a structure insofar as we can express it in terms of laws governing the elements. So we have to sort of differentiate the structure. Um, like, if, if all we could know about the universe is that it is articulated, um, that it is a structure, that would be a very thin and more or less empty knowledge of the universe. Um, so we instead find that it is possible to grasp the uh, behavior of the elements or aspects of the universe in terms of the properties of those elements uh, and the laws governing their behavior. Um, uh, and it's only because we can do this that we can actually understand the uh, sort of differentiated um, uh, articulation of the universe. Um, so yeah, we, we, we can only grasp the universe as differentiated um, because we can use something like the notion of law to uh, understand the behavior of these uh, uh, partially separated or partially isolated elements of the universe. Um, yeah, so then he, he, he has this weird digression into sort of his, historical knowledge. Um, um, and yeah, so I think here he's he maybe thinking of like sort of the, the classic distinction between like, so this is something that uh, is associated with uh, Diltai, this idea that there's um, the Naturwissenschaften, so the sciences of nature that uh, provide causal explanations or explanations in terms of uh, laws of nature. Uh, and then there's the Geisteswissenschaften, um, the, I don't know, you, you sometimes translate it as human sciences, which is not exactly correct. Uh, here, I think he's using the term historical knowledge to sort of describe this kind of uh, uh, discipline. Um, but the idea is that this field, these kinds of, of disciplines involve this uh, sort of hard to explain notion of understanding uh, or of meaning. So when you're studying the the um, uh, you know, the nature of different chemicals and how they interact with each other, you don't have to use anything like a concept of meaning. You don't have to um, try to understand, you know, what this chemical uh, thinks of this other chemical or anything along those lines. Uh, you can understand it in terms of these um, causal laws. Uh, whereas if you're studying history, if you want to understand um, Egypt or whatever other, um, uh, you know, ancient civilization or whatever, then you do have to understand things in terms of meaning. You have to sort of say, like, um, you know, what did um, uh, a pyramid mean for uh, these people living in, in this place and the, uh, at this time? Um, you know, what, what sort of significance did it have in their lives and the functioning of their society and so on? Um, uh, so there's this notion that there's this opposition between these two sort of modes of study um, with their different um, domains of application. Uh, but then, um, yeah, so that the idea, so uh, yeah, I guess the uh, idea that he's trying to oppose here is that is one in which this uh, historical understanding would be um, sort of less fundamental than the um, understanding in terms of laws. Uh, so, and, and this is again sort of characteristic of the Gestalt psychology approach to this kind of question. Um, which you know uses this notion of form and this sort of intrinsic um, meaningfulness, this melodic structure, et cetera, um, but takes it to be sort of fundamentally reducible or dependent on this notion of the physical world, um, which is explicable in terms of laws of nature. Uh, and um, of course, there are you know uh, a variety of different nineteenth-century um, uh, attempts to give something like laws of history. Um, so you can think of like uh, uh, Auguste Comte has this um, account of, you know, the development towards um, um, rational uh, societies. Um, uh, Herbert Spencer, you know, this idea of progress through, um, you know, various phases. And, you know, somehow it, it just happens to be the case that like 19th century British uh, white dudes are like the realization of, of history. Um, uh, you know, there's the Hegelian, uh, you know, uh, history of um, the, you know, the, the development of history as the, the realization of, uh, of freedom over 
you know, various civilizations. Um, to some extent, you can connect the Marxist account of history to this tradition as well, like this progression between different uh, modes of production. Um, but anyway, there, there's these various attempts to give like uh, account of history in terms of the laws that um, that govern it. So, so you would treat history, human history, as in some sense comparable to um, like the evolution of the solar system or or um, some other um, sort of um, physical process that is ex explicable in terms of laws. Um, and yeah, so what Merleau-Ponty is arguing here or suggesting here is that um, yeah, we can't see these laws as or like this this idea that you would take the laws as like the the more fundamental um, level and then the sort of understanding level, the level at which uh, things have meaning as like being derived from the laws or secondary to the laws. Um, this is sort of, um, yeah, just repeating the, the same problem as in the case of like the reflex theory or like the more sophisticated attempts to like add something like a central processing to the reflex theory. Um, so yeah, we, we have to rely on something like laws, uh, you know, laws of nature, for example, when we study architecture, we, we have to understand like, you know, the fact that it's possible to build um, certain structures out of stone that you can't build out of, um, I don't know, wood or mud bricks or whatever. Um, you know, different materials have different properties um, as a result of their physical constitution and so on. Uh, so this allows us to understand like some of the constraints on, uh, you know, construction of a, of a building. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't um, sort of uh, exhaust the uh, nature of that building. So, like the fact that a temple is built out of stone doesn't tell you, you know, why the people there decided to build build a temple in the first place. Um, uh, but then, yeah. So he's sort of rejecting the idea that we can like uh, take these forces of history or these laws of history as like the basis, and then like add on a sort of uh, spiritual. Um, uh, like, um, you know, superstructure on top of them and say, like, you know, the, the real sort of fundamental factor is, like, the properties of stone, uh, and then we add on, like, a sort of dressing or decoration of, like, the meaning of this stone for the Egyptians or whatever. Um, we instead have to treat, like, Egypt, you know, as this sort of uh, structure that um, develops it over time through its own, you know, uh, dynamics and so on, and you know, this, you know, Egypt structure contains both the, um, the, you know, uh, meaning, I guess, elements. So, like, you know, why it's important to build a temple, why, you know, the people that uh, make, make up this structure um, dedicate time and energy and resources to, you know, building a temple. Um, but then also includes the, you know, physical nature of the environment, you know, the fact that this stone is available in this location and has this property, uh, uh, whereas other building materials are maybe not available or harder to extract or whatever. Um, so all of this would be would be part of this same structure that is Egypt as this concrete entity with its own dynamics. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we um, this is ultimately like the science of Egyptology is ultimately um, uh, sort of the study of the internal dynamics of Egypt, the, this Egypt structure, uh, as it develops over time, um, as opposed to like sort of a, a decoration of you know the Egyptian culture on top of this set of uh, more fundamental forces of history. Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah. So, any other um, sort of comments or questions about this bit before we move on? Uh, yeah. Okay. So everyone understands Egypt now. We're all like Egypt experts. I already know it from the phenomenology of spirit, obviously. Right. Yeah, that's all you need to know. Yeah, just uh, this very abstract, uh, like third-hand uh, discussion of Egypt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can go on to the next bit. Yeah, if you want to. Uh, so we are at um, yeah, page one forty-three against every attempt. Uh, okay. Against every attempt to treat primary qualities as autonomous objects of thought, it remains correct to ar to argue with Berkeley that space presupposes color. The mathematical expressions by which physics characterizes its objects do not cease to belong to mathematics and express precisely a physical phenomenon only if one conceives of them as laws of certain forms, of certain concrete wholes, form, and with it, the universe of history and perception. 
remains indispensable on the horizon of physical knowledge is that which is determined and intended by it. Quote, Doubtless the sensible content of the perceptual given can no longer be considered as something true in itself, bonsoir, but the substrate carrier, the empty X of the perceived determinations, must also be considered as that which is determined in terms of physical predicates by the exact methods. Quote, Thus form is not a physical reality, but an object of perception. Without it, physical science would have no meaning. Moreover, since it is constructed with respect to it and in order to coordinate it, that in the final analysis, form cannot be defined in terms of reality, but in terms of knowledge, not as a thing of the physical world, but as a perceived whole, is explicitly recognized by Kohler when he writes that the order and form, quote, rests on the fact that each local event, one could almost say, dynamically knows the others, quote. It is not an accident that in order to express this presence of each moment to the other, Kohler comes up with the term quote-unquote knowledge. A unity of this type can be found only in an object of knowledge. Taken as a being of nature, existing in space, form would always be dispersed in several places and distributed in local events, even if these events mutually determine each other. To say that it does not suffer this amounts to saying that it is not spread out in space that it does not exist in the same manner as a thing, that it is, that it is the idea under which it happens in several places, uh, that it is the idea under which what happens in several places is brought together and resumed. This unity is the unity of perceived objects. The colored circle which I look at is completely modified its physiognomy by an irregularity which removes something of its circular character and makes it an imperfect circle. It is from the universe of perceived things that Gestalt theory borrows its no form. It is encountered in physics only to the extent that physics refers us back to perceived things, as that to which, as to that which it is science to express and determine. Thus far, the quote unquote physical form being able to be the real foundation of the structure of behavior and in particular of its perceptual structure is itself conceivable only as an object of perception. It sometimes happens that physics, in its increasing fidelity to the concrete spectacle of the world, is led to borrow its images, not from the poorly integrated holes which furnish classical science models, and in which one could attribute absolute properties to separable individuals, but from the dynamic unities, fields of force, and strong structures, which the world of perception also offers. It has been possible to say that, in abandoning homogeneous space, physics resuscitated the, quote, natural place, unquote, Aristotle. For the most part, Aristotle's physics is only a description of the perceived world, and Kohler precisely has shown very well perceptual space is not a Euclidean space, that perceived objects change properties when they change place. In the same manner, system wave mechanics, which considers a group of particles in interaction, is obliged to quote-unquote quote, unquote, dismember their individuality and to take into consideration not the waves associated with each particle, but a wave associated with the entire system, which will propagate itself in an abstract space called, quote, configurational space. Unquote. The impossibility of attributing a localization in ordinary space to each particle, the appearance, uh, the impossibility of attributing a localization in ordinary space to each particle in the appearance of properties in an ensemble, which are irreducible to those of the assembled elements, can very well be related to certain properties of perceptual space. Should I just finish this? So there's one paragraph. Yeah, go for it. The ambivalence of time and space at the level of perceptual consciousness reminds one of the mixed notions by means of which modern physics goes beyond the abstract simplicity of classical time and space. It should not be concluded from this that forms already exist in a physical universe and serve as an ontological foundation of perceptual structures. The truth is that science, on the basis of certain privileged perceptual structures, has sought to reconstruct the image of an absolute physical world, of a physical reality, of which these structures would no longer be anything but the manifestations. In accordance with the spirit of positivism, the perceptual given should be only the point of departure, a proteron pros hemas, a provisional intermediary between us and the ensemble of laws. And these laws explaining 
by their combined interplay, the appearance of such and such a state of the world, the presence in me of such and such sensations, the development of knowledge, and even the formation of science, should thus close the circle and stand independently. On the contrary, as we have seen, the reference to a sense of or historical given is not a provisional imperfection. It is essential to physical knowledge. In fact, and by right, a law is an of knowledge and structure as an object of consciousness. Laws have meaning only as a means of conceptualizing the perceived world. The reintroduction of the most unexpected perceptual structures into modern science, far from revealing forms of life or even of mind as already a physical world in itself, bonsoir, only testifies to the fact that the universe of naturalism has not been able to become self-enclosed and that perception is not an event of nature. So this is a pretty strong um, phenomenological position. It's sort of like, uh, I guess, especially late, later Husserl and um, this idea that, uh, you know, science always starts from this something like a life world or a perceptual situation um, and has a history constituted within life worlds and perceptual situations. Um, it seems like what he's saying is that we earlier had this dialectic of structure and law in which neither was capable of grounding the other. There was law and structure and structure and law. And so, you know, like in the antinomies in the transcendental dialectic, um, he's sort of looking underneath the, uh, this dialectical situation, which he sees as incapable of resolving itself to find its ground. And the ground that he posits is the perceptual situation itself, which is a pretty cool argument. Um, I think that they, like that's was saying this earlier, but there's this idea in here of form as a uh, kind of unattainable epistemological goal, which also reminds me of now, uh, in this case of the, the regulative idea of reason. Um, it seems like a, I don't know if he's explicitly saying this, but it seems like a very, very Merleau-Pontian move to um, take this intellectualist Kantian idea of a regulative idea and uh, ground it in bodily perception. Yeah, so yeah, I think the, the comparison with Peter Husserl is a good one here. Um, um, yeah, there's this... Um, um, this idea that we, yeah, when we understand science, we have to understand it as, uh, in some sense, a secondary phenomenon or something that's founded in something else, rather than starting from the depiction of the world that science gives us as the fundamental. Um, uh, yes, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so Merleau-Ponty actually, um, so in the period when he was working on this book, was um, uh, was you know studying. Uh, the Husserl archives, so a lot of the materials that um, he was working with had not been published yet at this point. Uh, and w I think he does use like Eden to uh, like the some of the materials that that was that were not published um, at the time and were only published posthumously. Uh, in, I think he uses them in this book and definitely in the phenomenology of perception. He, he uses them. Um, um, so yeah, like Husserl, you know wrote like this incredible amount of uh manuscripts that are often pretty uh, uh obscure um and i think he used some sort of shorthand as well if i remember correctly um um so it's taken a long time to uh you know publish a lot of them i think there's still some that have not been published yeah um so uh yeah like he, some of the stuff was like available to scholars that you know went to the archives in uh in uh belgium um um uh you know in the 30s and, and then like uh, after world war ii um uh so like yeah some of this material was like known to uh, sort of the phenomenology world beforehand but uh, a lot of the stuff you know was only published decades later um uh yeah so he's using this this notion that yeah we have to start with sort of this life world level or the world of perception as what is sort of most uh fundamental um and we have to understand science as something that um Sort of abstracts from all the complexity and um, concreteness of the life world and produces these like simple uh, interactions of quasi isolated elements of the world, um, um, as opposed to like maybe a more um, 
traditional understanding of the relationship between science and uh, perception would be that like what is ultimately real is the world as described by physics, uh, you know, interactions of particles and forces and so on. Uh, and then out of that sort of uh, picture, out of these particles and forces and some sort of complicated process of interaction, we will eventually be able to explain how perception or the world as we perceive it um, is, is sort of uh, realized. Um, so yeah, these are sort of alternate um, directions of explanation or like projects for how we can understand the relationship between uh, the world as depicted by natural science and, and specifically physics on the one hand, and then the world as perceived or the life world on the other hand. Um, yeah, so which one do we want to take as fundamental and which one do we want to take as being uh, explained by or um, arising out of the other? Um, yeah, he, yeah, he, I think, maybe goes a little bit quickly here in his, um, his argument for this position. Like, he doesn't uh, sort of give a, a detailed defense of this position. I think he's going to, you know, sort of rely on the remainder of this chapter and the rest of the book to, you know, uh, support this position. But, um, yeah, the, the idea, like, as, as it's presented so far, is that um, we can only grasp something like a law of nature um, as something that arises through abstraction from the concrete um, structure uh, of the world. Um, so we, we, we see it as like um, conceptually and then um, to some extent, you know, in a degree of approximation, um, um, we, you know, can through experiments uh, isolate certain elements of the world. Um, but this is always something that happens like secondarily to this concrete, concretely realized world that already exists. Um, and it's only because of this that we can actually understand a law as something more than just like, you know, a sequence of like ink marks on a page or, you know, dark spots on a computer screen or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, so a law is only something more than like squiggles uh, of dark versus a light background uh, insofar as it is connected to um, the concrete structure of um, you know, this really existing world that has its own internal dynamics. Um, yeah, so it's, it, this, this is sort of the, the general um, background on which he, he wants to, um, yeah, appeal to, he, he's appealing to this general um, idea to say that we have to treat the perceptual world as, um, yeah, as something that can't be, like, uh, reduced or um, made secondary to the physical world, even if we find things in the physical world or structures in the physical world that um, are in some sense equivalent or isomorphic or similar, analogous or whatever to these perceptual structures like the, the Gestalt psychologist tried to do. So like, even if you can find, um, you know, these uh, things like the electromagnetic field that involve this um, reciprocal interaction of all the points with each other, um, even in that case, you can't say that this is like, you know, the, the sort of more fundamental um, level of reality and then the perceptual uh, vital level would be like some sort of um, more complex realization or, or dependent phenomenon that arises out of that more fundamental level. Uh, okay, so we are at a section break and uh, approaching the two hour mark. So I suggest we will end here unless there's any like final comments or questions on today's reading. Um, one thing that I like about Philip is that uh, he's, even though he has this, you know, strong kind of late Husserlian phenomenological standpoint, he still insists on this, what he calls like the truth of naturalism. And so it's not, it's this, to me, this satisfying middle position between a, a kind of, um, I guess, more standard realist naturalism and something like, uh, um, you know, Kantian transcendental idealist position, because he's uh, obviously engaged with the like you know empirical science uh, cognitive sciences and neuroscience and um he just you can i think with the merleau-pontian perspective you can use insights from uh like neuroscience for instance and take a phenomenological um stand understand them from a phenomenological standpoint um which it seems like for him often to this uh aspects of pre-reflective 
but still kind of pre-phenomenological experience. Sorry, that's kind of rambling a bit, but um, yeah, it's just a, it's a satisfying middle position for me, I think. Yeah, so like um, one, one of those uh, posthumous Husserl texts, um, I, I can't remember exactly when it's from, and I don't know if Mendel Ponty was uh, you know, familiar with it, but there's one that has the title, uh, The Earth Does Not Move, um, where he argues that um, the sort of uh, Copernican uh, Galilean picture of the Earth as a body that moves through space is something that is um, sort of incompatible with the um, you know life world understanding of motion as being relative to the Earth. Like motion is uh, in the sort of, in the life world, motion is um, always defined with respect to the Earth as the solid ground which um you know by definition doesn't move or, or you can't even say that the earth is at rest for for who say it's, it's just that uh in relation to which motion is defined uh and then rest would just be like um the absence of motion with respect to the earth um and so it's yeah i mean it's not 100 percent clear from that text like how exactly we should understand you know the copernican worldview and you know the galilean picture of motion and so on um but yeah, it's definitely um, uh, hard to um, sort of put yourself in the framework of like, yeah, saying that uh, the motion of the Earth is something that like, um, yeah, is is sort of uh, not real or not sort of fundamental in some sense. It's like uh, a secondary. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think um, what Mertel Ponty does is um, I think a more careful examination of sort of the detailed um, results of natural science, uh, you know, whether it's psychology or um, physiology, et cetera, um, compared to Husserl is, I think, much less interested in looking at those details. And um, yeah, he's, he's much more, I think, um, much more willing to sort of reject, you know, the scientific worldview or the, the picture of the world as, uh, as depicted by science, like sort of as a whole, and just say this is like, you know, not... Um, not fundamental or it's like sort of you know uh, a fiction you know uh, derived from the the fundamental layer of the life world okay uh yeah so let's uh end here um so thanks everyone for coming out and for your contributions and uh hope to see you next week